You can't beat a team three times in one season. Yeah, you can. 38 to 7, your Philadelphia Eagles advance to the NFC Championship game as we welcome you to Eagles Post Game Live presented by Cure Audio Insurance. What a game, what a victory. Barrett Brooks is here, Ray Dittinger pouring over copious notes, the Hall of Famer back, Ruben Frank is with us over at the game, and then back here, uh, Ron Jaworski back joining us next week. We have all the interviews coming your way, and this was never really close. This was never contested really by the New York Giants because the Eagles beat them down offensively and defensively. Defensively, whether it was the sacks, whether it was scoring 21 points with seven minutes left this in the first half, Barrett. Total and utter domination. This team went out there and, and evoked their will on this team. This is the way they needed to play. We all knew that they were going to this game fired up and ready to rock and roll. And they just goes to show why they're the best team. And I've been screaming at the best team in the NFL, not in the NFC, but in the NFL. Mm -hmm. uh, Ruben, your observations of this one that saw Jalen Hurts play a damn good game. Oh, everybody played a great game. And uh, I, I felt like this game was over after two possessions. You know, the, I mean, the Eagles stopped the Giants and they scored. And it just seemed like it was going to be no contest. I, I really felt after each team had one possession, it was over. Yep, exactly. They you were know. dominating at such a level. They, they moved the ball so easily, effortlessly. It was clear Jalen was healthy, like we talked about on pregame. And defensively, if you can pressure Daniel Jones to take away their running game, they just don't have any ways to beat you. Right. Uh, it cracked me up that they're running the ball. They're down 28 nothing, and they score a touchdown running the ball, running seven minutes off the clock. What are you doing? That was like a, it was like a cowardly touchdown drive. It's like, all right, we're just not going to throw the ball no matter what. They're at half, they're, they're at half the, you know, half uh, field to 50, and they choose to punt it. You know, that late in the game, you, you got to be trying to score. They, they have no try. passing game. They have no. no passing game, and can't play like that. With that front the Eagles have, the pressure they get, yeah, when, Lurie. when a team's in, in, in known pass, you, they're just not going to be effective. And uh, it fell right into the Eagles' hands. Once they built that lead and the Giants... Uh, just had no way to move the ball. Ray, we expected the Eagles to win this game. Uh, many of us expected to, them to win in the manner in which they did. But yet, perhaps because of the Giants' upset at Minnesota last week, there was this slight seed of doubt, and that was erased right off the bat, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. I, I think that um, all these guys watched the Giants game in Minnesota. Uh, and the Giants played very well out there. They really did. You can say what you want to say about Minnesota, maybe being a little, uh, maybe being a little bit of an inflated team at 13 wins. Maybe they really aren't that good. But still, I mean, the 13-win team playing at home, and the Giants went out there and played really good, won that game. The Eagles all watched it, and then they got to watch it again and again this week That's in meetings. Right. And I'm sure the coaches made the point to them that, hey, listen, we can't take these guys for granted. Because so much was going to be made of the fact that the Eagles have dominated the series, won 15 of the last 18. The Eagles have dominated the Giants here at the length, have won nine in a row. But the coaches kept coming back saying, look at the tape. Look at what the tape telling you. This is a good team. So the Eagles came out ready to play. You know, and I agree with the guys. I mean, I got the feeling at 14-0, this, <laughs> this game was pretty much over. And it played out in many ways kind of what we were talking about. If the Eagles got pressure on Daniel Jones, which they did. If they could stop the running game, which they did. Uh, if the offensive Miles line Sanders. could control, as they did. And the Eagles got some really good play from Dallas Goddard. We had talked about the fact that, you know, at the tight end, you know, the tight end last week uh, in Minnesota had a big game. There was a chance you could see a similar kind of game from Dallas Goddard. He got that and pretty much topped to bottom. I mean, everybody on this roster contributed in a big way, and, you know, now this team gets a chance to sit back tomorrow, watch Dallas and San Francisco play, and uh, get ready to host a game here next Sunday afternoon. I, I thought Shane Steichen called a masterful game. Uh, they threw early. It was kind of backwards. They, they usually run early, and then, you know, he, he threw early, uh, and then they kind of shut it down and just ran. Ended up with almost 270 rushing yards. Uh, second most ever, most since 1949 in a playoff game by the Eagles, postseason game. Here's some other notes on the win tonight for the Philadelphia Eagles uh, as they now go on to the <laughs> NFC Championship game. Their seventh championship game since 2001. They improved to 6-0 all-time in divisional round games at home. The second biggest halftime lead in franchise playoff history, 28-0, and we wondered about that, Ray, as we were approaching halftime. Man, 28-0. It's pretty good. Second biggest oh, halftime lead. Well, I, I was on that team that did a little better than that. Yeah, yeah. You, oh, you were. That was the Detroit, Detroit Lions game. Detroit Lions game. Yes, hey, thank as you. you. Yes.
decimated Robert Porsche. Yeah, Robert Porsche. <laughs> this kind of felt like that game. I didn't yeah, score yeah, as many yeah. points, but just the way it was over, uh, just like that 58-37 game. I mean, they scored some points at the end with Mikowski in there, but you, you just kind of sensed it was over. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, you know, it was 51-7, I think, in the third at the end of the third quarter, uh, middle of the third quarter. And this was like that. It was just no contest. You don't see that a lot in the postseason. You, know, you just don't see a team. But the Giants have no firepower. You know, if they're not running the ball, which they couldn't, once, especially once they were down, they don't have a way to move the ball. They don't have a way to score. It yeah. was over. We mentioned in the pregame program that five years ago tonight, the Eagles won the NFC Championship 38-7 to over the Minnesota Vikings. Same score as tonight's over the New York Giants. One round fewer, but then again, they added an extra regular season game. Ray, you were going to say? Uh, no, I was, I was going to say pretty much what, what you were just saying. And the... The way that the Eagles controlled this game, the point that Ruben made is, I kind of said to you at halftime, I said, you don't normally see postseason games, playoff games, play out this way. Even if going in, you know one team is significantly better than the other, these games have a way of playing close. For example, Kansas City Jacksonville today wound up playing out to be a close game, even though on paper you'd say, well, this one team's better than the other. But to come out and dominate a team really from the jump, which is what the Eagles did in this game. And, you know, I, I thought that one of the things that was significant, the Giants' defense statistically, if you look at them, they were 24th defense. It didn't, on statistically, it doesn't look great. But the one area where they were pretty good was they were really good on third down and they were really good in the red zone. That's how they were keeping the point totals down. Not anymore. And not in this game. I mean, the Eagles <laughs> hit every, every third down in the first half and were four for four in the red zone in the first half. They put this game away, beating the Giants we're at areas where we thought the Giants were pretty good. Yeah. And here's Here's a look at the Super Bowl tournament bracket. Bill Parcells always used to call it the Super Bowl tournament. The Eagles are in the tournament and then some. They're going to the conference championship game against Dallas or San Francisco. And that game will be contested tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. in Santa Clara. So, and then it's the Chiefs, excuse me, uh, 3 o'clock and then Chiefs Buffalo or Cincinnati, and that game is tomorrow at 6.30, and then Super Bowl 57, Sunday, February 12th, yep. out in Glendale, Arizona. Mike, you know what strikes me when I'm looking at that bracket? This is the Eagles' seventh NFC Championship game since 2001. Now, the Patriots are the only team to be in more conference championship games, you know, one, two, three, and four, then 2008, then obviously uh, 2017 and, and this year. So uh, you're looking at 20 years of... You know, a team that's really putting together deep playoff runs. That's very unusual. To what do you owe that? Jeff Lurie hiring great head coaches and Howie Roseman kind of finding his way. And, you know, certainly was beleaguered there for a while. But since he was restored to power, he's, he's been a different guy. And he's building some great rosters. Barrett, what would you say to that? What did, would you also give it to Jeffrey Lurie and Howie Roseman, right? That's, that's the continuity in this equation. I mean, it? Howie wasn't GM until, you know, until but he was 2010. There. But, yeah, he was here. That's, that's absolutely what it is. You know, this team builds. They build from within, meaning they build in the trenches and they go out. It just so happened when they pulled the trade off of, you know, of A.J. Brown that everything just accelerated into them becoming a, a Super Bowl winning team, not just getting there, but winning team. Um, they have a lot of faith in the people they bring in, not just the athletes and how athletic they are, but how they'll mix in and, and, and figure into the whole scheme of, 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 you know, the culture inside that locker room. So, I mean, you got to take your hats off to, you know, Mr. Lurie and uh, you got to take your hat off to, to Howie and, and, and his approach with the coaches also. And Andy Reid. Yeah. No, because Andy Reid has his, his hand in all of these. I mean, obviously the, the first five, he was the coach. But you look at Jason Kelsey. Uh, you, you look at Brandon Graham, you right. look at Fletcher Cox. These are guys he brought in. Absolutely. I mean, he, his fingerprints are all over everything this franchise is doing. And momentarily, we'll hear from some of those players. Certainly, we'll hear from Nick Sirianni and Jalen Hurts in a strong Eagles, a definitive, decisive Eagles victory over the New York Giants. Ray, when you look at Howie, C.J. G.J., uh, A.J. Brown, Hassan Reddick, James Bradbury, and we heard Joe Davis on the play-by-play -play on Fox, incredulous that they could pick up the these quality players in the offseason, yet that's what they did. They did. Uh, and, <laughs> you know, Howie was really under the microscope this whole offseason because people were, there were a lot of people wanted him out of here. They didn't want him being the guy that was making the decisions with the three first round draft picks. No, 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 please, anybody but Howie. Uh, but what you've seen is he. 
he pretty much hit every right button here. Uh, his draft was good. He brought in some good players in the draft. Uh, and his free agent acquisitions were outstanding. And then, of course, the big grand slam was the, was the draft night trade for A.J. Brown, who has really brought a, a receiver to this offense, the likes of which we really haven't seen since T.O. And he's a perfect complement, really, for Devontae for Devonte Smith. So I think that, you know, Howie... For how he's taking his lumps here, for sure. He's taking his lumps in the media. He's taking his lumps on talk radio. He's taking his lumps right here at this desk. But you got to give him his credit. I mean, there's, I mean, they will give him an Executive of the Year award in the NFL this year. He won it once before in 2017 when the Eagles went on their way to the Super Bowl. I think he's got to win it again this year because this was an equally masterful job. By the way, you mentioned A.J. Brown, Reuben, and Barrett. We were talking about that as we came down to the studio. It, it, some thought A.J. Brown might have been nicked, dinged, etc. Uh, but the two of you said he was just removed from the game because the Eagles started to run the ball. Correct? Yeah, absolutely. You mean, it, it, this just wasn't a passing game where they needed their guys outside, you know. But, I, you know, I want to say one more thing about sure. Howie and how he, um, how he approached this team. You know, you look at what, what the Rams did. The Rams went out and they bought a Super Bowl. They went out and got all the players. But they signed their players to long-term contract. Howie did this. And, you know, I know he's not at the Super Bowl yet, but how he did it, and all those contracts will be off the board next year. Now, he's going to have to sign a couple of these guys back in order to keep the nucleus of, of, of the, you know, this championship quality type of team. You know, we'll see if they win it or not. But he didn't, you know, he didn't give up his soul to win, a, to win a Super Bowl. He will have all these contracts off the board next year. You know, the Linville Joseph, the Dominic And Sue, two first-round picks. Kazir White, you know, CJ GJ. All these guys came in on one-year deals. Another thing about Howie, you, you know, we talk about, like, the blockbuster acquisitions and, and, and all that, and they've been terrific. But then you look at, like, Kenny Gainwell today. It was over 100 oh, yards. Right. Fifth-round fifth <laughs> pick. Boston Scott got a, as a waiver claim. You know, right, Marcus right. Epps, who, who played really well tonight, waiver claim, got cut by the Vikings. So it's not just the blockbuster moves. I yeah. mean, he's, he's creative. Uh, he's finding guys. I mean, Jordan Mulata, for crying out loud, who's a, a rugby player. And ru Landon this whole, Dickerson, I mean, this whole, well, yeah. well, I mean, he was a high pick, but the, this roster is dotted with really good players who Howie found, late-round draft picks. Reed Blankenship, undrafted. Right. He wasn't even a priority undrafted guy. He got the second-lowest guaranteed money out of all their 12 he was, the last guy on the, he was the last guy on the roster to make the roster. And the he made the roster. Guy. He was great tonight. Yeah, and how about, how about the MVP candidate, Jalen Hurts? He wasn't bad. Acquired, he wasn't bad, but they acquire him in the second round. <laughs> and that really, uh, that really portended the demise of Carson Wentz because as soon who? as Hurts, Carson who? Carson Wentz, because as soon as Hurts was drafted, Wentz went right into the tank. Well, look, you know, it was me, it was Ray, it was D Gunn, and we sat back and we were doing a draft show. And uh, we like... Jalen Hurts? What, what are we doing? And that's when we heard the quarterback factory thing come out. Well, look what's happening now. Yeah. There's, yeah. Honestly, <laughs> yeah, that's right. I mean, I... I, I got I to give him tremendous credit for the Hurts pick in the second round. I mean, it turns out to be really inspired. But at that time, and we were doing the show together, yep. and they picked second round Jalen Hurts. I was floored, to be honest <laughs> with you. And I thought, okay, what, 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 what am I missing here? Yeah. What am I, look, I saw the guy play in college. I saw him play at Alabama. I saw him play at Oklahoma. I thought he was a good player. But I had him as a fourth-round pick. Uh, and I started to call in some of the people, like the next day, some guys I knew around the league, and said, where did you have Jalen Hurts? Third round? Second? I said, did anybody have him in the second round? As far as we know, only the Why did you have him fourth round? I just didn't think he was, I just didn't think he'd throw it well enough. You know, I mean, he certainly could run it, and he was obviously a tough, competitive kid who won a ton of games in college. But, I mean, as, as a passer, I mean, he just didn't look like an NFL passer. But the one thing you could not underestimate and has been proven out for sure is, boy, is he a worker. I mean, you look at how much he has improved each step of the way from Alabama to Oklahoma to the NFL and then each year in the NFL. He's, ha he's had that work ethic to just keep working at it and working at it to the point where, I mean, he has now become basically a 70% completion guy and just seems to be, I mean, this leadership the sky, quality. Yeah, yeah. The, sky, the sky's the limit for him. It really yeah. is. 16 to 24, 154 yards, sack one time, two touchdown passes, and a passer rating of 112.2. To me, it, it's his spirit, his personality. Personality. You mentioned his work ethic, but you know, you, you go to play for Nick Saban in Alabama, he, he 
benches you, right. and you leave. You go to uh, Oklahoma, you end up being... Well, you actually a, stayed. He yeah, left, left two stayed, years later. Right, he left, left two, two years yeah. later, yeah. but still, I mean, that, take, that takes a lot of wherewithal to do that. Absolutely. Then you get picked in the second round, then you're on the bench behind Carson Wentz, and then you fight your way to starter. Running gadget plays his first year. Just nothing but gadget plays, and now look at him now. I mean, this, his work ethic, his leadership quality. He came in day one, and none of the players on the team saw him as a real backup quarterback. When they saw him, he said the way he carried himself, the leadership quality he displayed as a young guy when he was in the huddle. He commanded the huddle. He commanded this team. They knew something we didn't know. We are waiting to hear from Nick Sirianni. Customarily, he comes out first, the head coach of the Philadelphia Eagles. We'll be hearing from players in the locker room, also at the podium as the birds sell it. Well, we might celebrate a little bit. The fans might celebrate. I don't know if they're celebrating 38-7 to win over the New York Giants. It's another step for them. It, yep. it just another, you know what said something to me? Is, is and we showed this in the pregame show, Brandon Graham on the sideline, pregame, he's normally, you can see all the teeth, he's normally smiling, he was straight, you know, straight line. Time not, to go to work. Not you know, the, the guys to to that played in that Tampa game, which is a good chunk of this roster, they weren't going to let it happen again. They, they knew they weren't really prepared. Obviously, it was a road game. It was against Brady and, and the Bucks when they were still very good. Uh, they weren't going to let it happen again, and their whole approach was different. They were... They were locked in. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned uh, the game plan, and Shane Steichen calling a great game plan Brilliant. offensively and, and uh, getting um, Dallas Goddard involved, which he, he, he missed this, uh, the uh, five games in the season. He comes back with a great game plan. They, they didn't want any part of him. Uh, and like, his numbers aren't overwhelming. What do you have, uh, five for 58 you yeah. know, and a touchdown? Good numbers. But his, his impact on this game was huge. Uh, you know, he was just trampling people. He was blocking his ass off. Uh, the one-handed touchdown obviously was, you know, the highlight, but um, he's just such a force, and I don't think the Giants' defense wanted anything to do with him. They have, they have, they get really good blocking on the edges with this team. I mean, Their receivers Got block great. Goddard time. is Goddard is a really good blocker. I mean, and that's one area he came in here as a as a good route runner and a good receiver. We all saw that, but you know, you he, you hoped he would work on his blocking. Well, boy, he has. He's got to the point now where he's a plus blocker. I mean, he's a, he's not just okay; he's good. And you've got two wide receivers now who both will block. I mean, A.J. Brown is a good blocker, and Devontae Smith, even though he's not the biggest guy, is certainly willing to get in the way. So that's one of the reasons why, there are many reasons why this running game is so efficient, and Hurts is a big part of it in the line for sure. But you got really good guys blocking on the edges and putting in that effort to get guys around the corner. I mean, this is, when this team wants to run the ball and they're committed to running the ball, and they sure were tonight, I don't know if there's anybody in the league can stop him. Well, you got to give Miles Sanders, um, you know, you got to tip his hat to him because his way of running the rock has definitely changed since his first two years. But now he's so patient on how he runs the rock. He picks the hole. The hole, he lets the blocking develop in front of him. Then he hits it. He, he played this game like, you know, a, a chess game on how he was picking his holes and where to go, how he developed blocking, pushed guys by, stopped, was able to re re uh, accelerate faster. I, I would dare to say that I, I saw the best Penn State back wearing green today. Miles, 